Well, welcome to the Church Street campus of Layton High. This is the U.S. government and civics. I'm so excited to talk to you today about uh, some of the important ideas of ancient sources of modern thought. We began a little bit about this in class together as we read ideas from the Declaration of Independence, the preamble to the Constitution, and even Lincoln, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And I gave you a document that has those in it. And then the other items that I'm going to be reading with you today as we push ahead with our study of these ideas. Please follow along with the document I gave you and mark the key ideas that I stop and talk about because those will be the answers to the test questions which will follow when you get back to class you know, next time around. So, or I might stick them on at the end here. I haven't made up my mind yet, but either way, we'll survive. So I want you to begin with Homer's Iliad. You know, the Iliad was written down by Homer, or at least by a scribe listening to Homer, about 800 BC. But the incidents in the Iliad took place about 1200 BC at the time of the Trojan War. And the ideas that are in them are foundational to Western thought and to world thought concerning what justice and right and good is. And if you want to understand these things, you need to read the Iliad, okay? It's the foundation of our, of our country and our culture more than any other group of ideas. It's that powerful, I guarantee you. Everybody used to read the Iliad. Not very many people do anymore. But in the Iliad, we have, and this is what the first quote is, we have a young man named Achilles who didn't want to go to war, but he was the king's son of one of the islands and commander of the Myrmidons, his dad, who had been a famous Greek hero right up there with Jason and Heracles. He was too old to go, but uh, his mother, a goddess, this was a Achilles' mother, a goddess, had been trying to hide him so he wouldn't go to war. He's just a teenager. He's not old enough to go. But Agamemnon, the king, has received a prophecy that he can't win the war without Achilles. And so Achilles agrees to go. And for nine years, he fights. Of course, he draws from a 14-year-old teenager to a 23-year-old young man. And in the process, he falls in love with a beautiful girl who he captures on the battlefield or in the city he conquers, but he falls in love with her, and instead of just abusing her and raping her the way so many people do in those horrible situations, he marries her, and they are very happy together. But then there comes a day when the king, the high king, whose name is Agamemnon, the ruler of all the Greek kingdoms, is kind of the head of the United Nations, if you would, um, is given a chance to return a young girl who he is using for his um, pleasure because her father shows up and offers gold in exchange for her, which is the tradition, it is the custom, it is the law. It's a ransom. He doesn't have to take it, but it would be good if he does, but he flat refuses to. But there's a problem. This particular man, Chryses, is the high priest of Apollo. And he goes to Apollo and he says, they're not being just with me. They're not doing what they should be. And so Apollo smites the Greeks with a plague and people start dying. They rush to the prophet and they ask the prophet, why are we dying? Why are we being killed? What have we done wrong? We've been here for 10 years and there's been no disease. And the prophet says, I'm not telling you, it's too dangerous. And Achilles speaks up. He says, go ahead and tell us. I will protect you. And so uh, the prophet says, okay, what the heck? And he says, uh, it's the king. It's Agamemnon. He won't give up the girl. And so Apollo is angry. And so Achilles, who's very young, barely into his 20s, turns to the high king of all the Greeks and says, what kind of jerk are you to put the lot, your personal physical pleasure ahead of the lives of your soldiers? Give the girl back. Well, now Agamemnon feels he can't do this because he can't be ordered around by a kid. And so he refuses at first. 
and uh, Achilles goes to whack him, but Athena, goddess of justice, intervenes and he doesn't kill him. And when he sees Achilles back down, he does too, he being Agamemnon. He says, okay, I'll give the girl back on one condition. I'm taking your wife. Now Achilles goes on then to say this statement. He's saying, and I'll read it to you, but he's, what he's effectively saying is, why are we here? Why are we fighting? If you know anything about the Iliad, it's in an effort to retrieve Helen, the wife of Agamemnon's brother, Menelaus, king of Sparta, and they've been fighting there for 10 years to get a woman back who's been stolen by a man, and now here is the king stealing Achilles' wife. And Achilles is going to say, from me alone, Achilles, of all Achaeans, Achaeans means the Greeks, he, Agamemnon, seizes, he keeps the wife I love. Why must we battle Trojans, men of Argos? Why did he muster an army, lead us here, that son of Atreus? Why in the world, if not for Helen with her loose and lustrous hair? Are they the only men who love their wives, those sons of Atreus? Never. Any decent man, a man with sense, ability to reason and think, loves his own, cares for his own as deeply as I. I loved that woman with all my heart, though I won her like a trophy with my spear. But now that he's torn my honor from my hands, robbed me, lied to me, don't let him try me now. I know him too well. He'll never win me over. In other words, I no longer have to obey him because he is no longer king. When he became unjust, he became unking. And this is surely the idea that was in the mind of the writers of the Declaration of Independence when they had to deal with our buddy George III. I have a couple of analects here from Confucius about 500 BC. One, remember these are short wise sayings, Confucius say, and he says, faced with what is right, to leave it undone shows a lack of courage. So if your government is unjust and you don't do anything about it, you're a coward. And Confucius also says, if what he, the ruler says, is good, and no one goes against him, good. So if you have a good emperor, whoopie doo, don't be causing trouble. But if what he says is not good and no one goes against him, is, that, is this not almost the case of leading the state to ruin? If you follow an unjust ruler, is that not going to ruin your country? Pretty good arguments from ancient China. Now going back to ancient Greece, Aeschylus is one of the three great playwrights. I'm sure you learned all these things in your World Civ class. And about 458 BC, she writes, she, he writes, I'm gonna to get to the she, that's Athena, but he um, writes a series of three plays about Agamemnon, his death, then the death of his wife who murders him, and then the trial of their son, or Orestes, who actually kills his mother to avenge, avenge his father. He is chased then by the Furies. The Furies are these female deities, the daughters of night, who represent the blood grudge. Now this is how we used to deal with problems in the old days. Someone kills your dog, you kill their dog. You kill their ox, they kill your ox. You kill their son, they kill your son or you or somebody. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Athena is going to present to them in this court, this trial in the third of the plays in the Orestes cycle called the Eumenides or the Furies. She's going to present, Athena is, a new way of looking at legal process. And so she speaks, you have come to my temple, she's talking to or, um, Orestes, as a suppliant, a broken down wanderer, purified and incapable of causing harm by your converse, so that though originally guilty, I receive you to my Acropolis, the temple of justice, as if free from blame. This is the idea of innocent until proven guilty. 
458 BC, the Greeks would go to the theater and see in this beautiful religious play related to the sacrifice of the sacred king, of course, but also related to ideas that they all needed to know. They're being taught about the importance of a accused person being innocent until proven guilty. For their parts, these furies have a duty to perform, which makes it hard to dismiss them. And if they should fail to gain their cause in this suit, here, after, poison falling on the ground in consequence of their anger will be a lasting disease causing barrenness to the land. So justice must be done. If someone has committed a crime and they're not punished for it, no matter how much we love them, how important and how good they are, if they're not punished, then there's going to be a disaster. So whether they're a police officer or a, or a soldier or whoever they are, if they commit a crime, they have to be punished. And that's the job of the prosecution. The prosecution must treat them innocent till prove them guilty and then prove them guilty. And if they can't prove them guilty, then boom, it's over. And so she says, I will appoint judges of murder. No more eye for an eye. No more someone kills you and then your kids kill them and you have the Hatfields and McCoys feuding until both families are wiped out and everybody else in the neighborhood gets dragged in and killed. No more of that. I will appoint judges of murder bound by oaths to be an institution for all time, and it still exists in America today, and do you furies, you prosecutors, call on testimony and evidence, the depositions of oath of, to forward the cause of justice. So here it is, 458 BC, in a religious play, the call of, in the uh, Dionysian ce um, celebration, the lesson to all the people on innocent until proven guilty and having a prosecution and a defense. And it turns out Apollo was going to be his defense. The second great Greek playwright is Sophocles, and he writes, among other things, the um, Oedipus cycle, three plays about Oedipus. He writes the last one chronologically, the tale of Antigone, first. And this little reading is from Antigone. Now, Antigone is the nephew of the new king, Creon. He's become king because both of his nephews, who were supposed to be taking turns as king before him, are dead. And so Creon wants to be king, and he wants to prove that he is a just king to his people, I suppose. And so he makes a law. The one prince, the one king, Eteocles, who fought on the side of of the city, uh, Thebes, and was killed by his brother, Polynices. They have twins, so which one gets to be king? They had decided to take turns, but when Eteocles' year was up, he wouldn't give it up, and so Polynices brought in enemies to overthrow the city, and they fight in front of the gates, and they're both killed, and Creon is ordered that Polynices cannot be buried. Well, this bothers his sister, Antigone, because Antigone knows, at least she believes, that if you're not buried, your soul cannot go to heaven to either go to, the, to be with the gods or to be reborn and get another shot at it. You're damned. You wander for eternity as a homeless ghost. And so she insists in her heart and in her actions that her brother must be buried. And so... Creon finds out that it was her. She's dragged in before him in court, the court where he is judge, jury, and executioner as king, his own palace. And he asks her this question. You, tell me not at length, but in a word. You knew the order not to do this thing, which is burying her brother to save him from damnation. Antigone I knew, of course I knew, the word was plain. Boom, that blows him up. And still you dared to oppose these laws? And now Antigone is going to explain 
why she opposes the laws, which is why we also oppose unjust laws. And by the way, Antigone is from 441 BC, a beautiful example of non-violent civil disobedience. There is a law which is unjust. She disobeys it and she accepts the punishment, which sadly in the end is death. I knew, of course I knew, the word was plain. I knew I wasn't allowed to take that seat at the front of the bus. I knew I wasn't allowed to go into the diner and sit up to the counter where the white people do. I knew, I knew, I knew. And still you dared to overstep the law? And then her answer, which is applies to all laws. For me, it was not Zeus who made that order, nor did the justice who lives in the, with the gods below, justice, eternal justice, Athena perhaps, mark out such laws to hold among mankind, or just na natural reason, huh? Nor did I think your orders, you kingish, you know, not real king, were so strong that you, a mortal man, could overrun God's unwritten and unfailing laws. Absolute truth laws, universally just laws, aren't written down. They might be referenced in constitutions and legal books, but they existed before the constitutions. And if the constitution is wrong, we figure it out and change it and make it match the eternal laws. Not now, not yesterday. They always live and no one knows their origin in time. Now, not long after Sophocles, the Greeks found themselves involved in a tremendous war with a huge empire that was trying to conquer them, and that's the Persian Empire, and they get launched into two Persian wars. And eventually Herodotus writes books describing those two wars, and he begins with um, how the empire of Cyrus the Great, the king of Persia, is established, and how Cyrus dies, and how his wicked son, Cambyses, takes over, though he does conquer Egypt, but he does it in a bad way, chucking cats at the Egyptians, how can they handle that? And then, um, at the death and overthrow of Cambyses, there is a meeting of the folks who overthrow him, and they have a debate on what kind of government we should have. This is Iranians, Iraqis, long before they were Americans, debating what kind of government is best. And one of them, named Otans, who was the leader of the revolution, he puts forward, which overthrew the Magus, who took the place of Cambyses. It's a long story. Take my Greek and Roman class. We'll get into it a little better. But here are the arguments of Cambyses for democracy. He's arguing for democracy. A tyrant disturbs ancient laws, violates women, kills men without trial. But a people ruling, first, the very name of it is so beautiful. And secondly, a people does none of these things. So, there you go, the definition of democracy, okay? The most beautiful thing talks about how evil kings are and claims that the people ruling do none of these things. Well, the others come back and argue, well, sometimes the people do, and that's true. Something must restrain the people, but a government of, for, and by the people has a better chance of being just than any other form. I read a book once that said that. I think the guy's name was Mosiah. Later in the um, Homer's, or Herodotus's books, the Persian king who takes Darius's place, the first king who's defeated by the Greeks, the second king, his son, Xerxes, is trying to conquer the Greeks. And his huge army seems unstoppable and yet every Greek city fights against him. He finally has a, um, his generals capture a young Greek soldier, and they're gonna find out what it is that keeps the Greeks fighting, 
even though it's obviously you're not going to win. And this is a beautiful little bit too. Um, the Greek prisoners to the Persian officials. You know perfectly well what it is to be a slave. And that's what most of the people, even in the world today, they know perfectly well what it is to be a slave. Freedom, you have never tried to know how sweet it is. Haven't we tested freedom? Are we willing to fight for it like our founding fathers were? Are we willing to fight those that would take away our freedom? If you had, you would urge us to fight for it, not with spears only, but even with hatchets. Once a Greek soldier's spear was broken, his sword was lost, his daggers spent, the only thing he had left was his little hatchet for chopping wood or chopping enemies until he had to go at it with his hands and teeth. Okay, the last few adventures in this reading are from Cicero, a Roman about the um, meridian of time. He is a, a contemporary of Julius Caesar, and so this is 51 BC, 51 years before Christ, and um, he is writing in defense of the Roman Republic, which is under great strain at the time. And as we'll know, um, Julius Caesar eventually tries to overthrow it. He gets killed for that. But then there are two civil wars, and eventually Octavian becomes Augustus, and it is the end of the Roman Republic after 500 years. I hope we make it as long. But this is uh, their dialogues like Plato. Um, Cicero loves Plato, and he's trying even though it's 450 years since Plato, but he, he's trying to copy his writing style of people having a discussion. And so his, his name is Marcus Cicero, and so he has himself talking in his own book, and he's saying, the law is the highest reason. So it's not something written down. It's implanted in nature which commands what ought to be done and forbids the opposite. We know what's right and wrong. We know right from wrong. All human beings do. It's our reason that teaches that. Perhaps it's the gift of Eve. I don't know, but we all know right from wrong. This reason, when firmly fixed and fully developed in the human mind, is law. It, and so they believe that law is intelligence whose natural function is to command right conduct and forbid wrongdoing. Now, if this is correct, and I think that, and I think it to be in general, then the origin of justice is to be found in law. If you act according to universal law, you're behaving justly. For law is a natural force. It's not made by legislatures. It's not made up by kings. It's a natural force. Now, legislators, including kings, try to enforce natural law if they're just. For law is a natural force. It is the mind and reason of the intelligent man. All of us recognize good, just law the standard by which justice and injustice are measured. If things are going on in our streets in America today, can we tell if they're just or unjust? You bet we can, because our minds can measure these things. But since our whole discussion has to do with the reasoning of the populace, it will sometimes be necessary to speak in the popular manner and give the name of law, notice I put a small L on this one, to that which is written from decrees, whatever it wishes, either by command or prohibition. For such is the crowd's definition of law. Well, it's the law that says you can do this. It's statute such and such and so and so. But that statute such and such and so and so can be unjust if it doesn't match universal law. But in determining what justice is, let us begin with the supreme law which had its origin ages before any written law existed or any state had been established, or as I argued with you, before human beings existed, before the Big Bang, justice existed. Mark is in a different point in the book, 
goes on to argue, this is Cicero on the laws, and um, in his Republic here, the last book in my stack, ever since we were children, or first, depending on how you're going here, ever since we were children, Quintus, we have called, if one summons another to court, or rules of the same kind laws. But we must come to the true understanding of the matter, which is as follows. This and other commands and prohibitions of nations have the power to summon to righteousness and away from wrongdoing, if they're just, if they're just laws, they do. But this power is not merely older than the existence of nations and states. It is coeval, which means of the same age as with the God who guards and rules heaven and earth. So if God has always existed, so has primeval law. It's always there. For the divine mind ex cannot exist without reason. That's how man and God are the same. God and man can both reason. I read a book about that once too. And divine reason, I think, I think our friend, um, Oh, come on, help me. The guy they chained to the rock and tore out his guts once a day. Prometheus, he gave us the ability to reason. That's why Zeus was mad at him, okay? Even if there was no written law against rape at Rome in the reign of Lucius Tarquinius, we cannot say on that account that Sexus Tarquinius did not break the eternal law by violating Lucretia, the daughter of Lucretius. So this prince rapes this married woman, this chaste, beautiful woman, wife, for reason did exist, derived from the nature of the universe, urging men to right conduct and diverting them from wrongdoing. And this reason did not first become law when it was written down, but when it first came into existence. And it came into existence simultaneously with the divine mind. Therefore, the true and primal law applied to command and prohibition is the right reason of supreme Jupiter, as it says in the Declaration of Independence, endowed by our creator, supreme Jupiter, with unalienable rights. Now, the person with whom Cicero, Marcus, is having his dialogue is his brother Quintus. And he says this beautiful sentence, so beautiful that it will be our memorization number two in a week. But here I'll read it to you and we'll talk about it quickly. Quintus replies, I agree with you, brother, that what is right and true is also eternal. Boy, that's a good test question. Okay? Is also eternal and does not begin or end with written statute. All right? There doesn't have to be a written law to tell us that owning another human being is wrong, that raping a woman is evil, that murdering a child is unacceptable, unacceptable. Oh, these things are obvious to us all. Okay? In another place, Marcus goes on to argue. Therefore, law is the distinction between things just and unjust made in agreement with the primal, the beginningal, and since there is no beginning, the all and most ancient of all things, nature. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. In the Declaration of Independence, it talks about nature and nature's God, so come on, that's where it is. It's either nature or it's God, it's either just that way or some great being created it to be that way. It doesn't matter. It's always existed. The most uh, made in agreement with the primal and most ancient of all things, nature. And in conformity to nature's standard are framed those human laws which inflict punishment upon the wicked but defend and protect the good. Laws must agree. Man-made laws must agree with natural law in order to be just. Now on the last page, just, a, just one more from Livy. Livy is a great Roman historian who was um, hired by Augustus Caesar to write down the history of the Romans. And like um, 
Cicero, he is deeply impressed by the story of the rape of Lucretia, an innocent woman, an innocent young wife, who is raped by a pervert, and on that account, 200 and the guy happens to be the next king of Rome, and the present king, his father, is an equal unjust jerk, and his mother is also a crazy woman. And so on this justified reason of raping and causing the death of an innocent girl, Marcus Brutus, the... Um, this is Bru Bru Brutus the Liberator. I'm his Marcus. I'm sorry. That seems to be right, but let's just call him Brutus. This is not the Brutus that killed Caesar. This is the one that that Brutus is named after. He, Brutus, organizes a revolution to overthrow the king and establish 500 years of Roman Republic. And so here is his Declaration of Independence and see how much it sounds like the ideas bound up in our American Declaration of Independence, in our Constitution, and in Abraham Lincoln's um, Gettysburg Address. By this girl's blood, none more chaste till a tyrant wronged her, and by the gods, I swear, that was sword and fire and whatever else can lend strength to my arm, is he willing to go to war to end injustice? Yes, he is. Does he think he's going to win that war? Mm, probably not, but he's willing to try. Did our founding fathers who signed the Declaration of Independence think they were going to win? No, they thought they were going to get hung, but they did it anyway because they had to do what was just and right. And with sword and fire and whatever else can lend strength to my arm, I will pursue Lucius Tarquinius the Proud, that was the name of the king, his wicked wife who had murdered her father to get her husband into the king position, and all his children. And never again will I let them or any other man be king in Rome. Now the word for king in Latin is rex. The word king actually comes from the word Caesar, so does the word Khan and the word Kaiser and the word Tsar, go figure. But um, the word King, Rex, is out from the Roman Empire from that day forward. Not even Augustus would be willing to call himself King of Rome, though some think Julius Caesar might have grabbed up the title, but he didn't get the chance. And the people who killed him, they died fighting for what they believed in. However, 30 years B.C., um, Livy explains to the Roman people that we must be willing to fight for what is eternally right and true, justice, and that any government that isn't just is not legitimate. And in America, we know that we are the rulers and so if we get involved with government that is becoming unjust, we have a way, we have a system through our constitution of changing the laws and making our government just. Now, we shouldn't do it violently. That was the lesson of um, so many people, including Martin Luther King Jr., but also of Antigone, the way to truly change unjust laws is by non-violent civil disobedience. If you behave unjustly in an effort to do away with injustice, you only lay the foundation for worse things to come. So, here you've listened to all of this. I'll get you the quiz. And take a good note right on the paper on the document I gave you. You'll be able to use that but please listen to what I had to say to you and take your notes as we go along. And then uh, we'll be in, in our in-class adventure. We're going to be moving on to our next uh, topic and next subject because we just have so little time. But for today, thank you for listening. Goodbye.